church said amen to that. Nicely done. Thank you so much for being here. Have a seat. Welcome to the Beltline Church of Christ. So excited to be here today. Didn't have an opportunity to say so earlier, but we want to welcome a new member among us. Uh, Fran Odell, if you, are here, if you are here, will you please stand up so we can recognize you today? Where's Fran? Where? Oh, there she is. Oh, welcome to the family. We are so glad that you're here. We're excited about what God's doing among us. And you can tell that today is one of those services where things are a little bit different. Uh, but I hope that uh, at the end we can say, man, this was an exciting day. A day where God was praised and glorified and exciting things are happening among us. I want to ask you the question as we get started. Would you say that you are a person who walks by faith? Would you say that about yourself? Now, anybody can say anything about themselves. I guess the real question would be, would other people say that about you? Would other people say that you are a person that walks by faith and not by sight? Because we all read together just a second ago that passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where Paul reminds the Corinthian church that we're to be of good courage because we know that while we are at home in this body, we are away from the Lord. And so because of that, you and I walk by faith and not by sight. And if you're anything like me, my guess is that you have moments where you do both. Moments when you're on the mountaintop, you're walking by faith, everything's going well, you see God's hand moving and acting, and you're like, wow, this is incredible. How does it ever get any better than this? And then you have those other moments where you want to walk by faith, but, but that something, that thing that's right there in front of you, that urgent thing, that obstacle, whatever it is that's going on in your life, stops you from being that spirit-led, faith-walking person that God would desire to you to be. You see, walking by faith isn't easy. Even Paul himself struggled with this. He tells the Roman church in chapter 7 that the things that I want to do, the walking by faith that I want to do, I don't always do those things. And the, and the things that I don't want to do, the walking by sight things, man, those are the things that I regularly practice. And he says, if it weren't for Jesus, man, I'd, be, I'd just be going crazy out here. It's not easy to consistently walk by faith, but... If we will follow Jesus, if we will, as we said last week, cover ourselves in the dust of our rabbi, if we will keep our eyes on him, then these things that are difficult, like consistently walking in faith, can become easier. I'm not going to say easy, but I'm going to say easier. This transition that we're talking about making and that we are making to multiple service is going to be an opportunity for all of us here to walk by faith and not by sight. And so what are you going to choose? What are you going to choose this morning? Are you going to be a person who consistently walks by faith or are you going to take an opportunity to walk by sight? You see, I am so thankful for our eldership. I'm thankful for their leadership. Because this decision to move to two services, in my opinion, shows leadership on full display. So many of the congregations that I've been a part of and that I've worked with throughout the years have been so reactionary. Every decision was made based on something that was happening right there in the moment. And leaders often have to do that. There's no doubt about that. But what good leaders do is they want to cast a vision for the future. Have you ever been to a mall and you walk in and, and you don't really, not quite know where you're going and so you find the directory and you have that little red dot that says you are here, right? Well, well, David, I think, made very clear, here's where we are. We're ready for this and now we're charting the course to the next place, the next destination, wherever God wants us to go next. We know where we are and soon we're going to begin taking the steps to get where we want to go. In other words, we're going to walk by faith. Because when dealing with space limitations as we have, your leaders have a choice, and you also have a choice in how you think about a solution. There's really two ways that we can look at this. We can look at this very simply as, well, our goal is just to alleviate crowding. That's one way to view this idea. We just need to make some more space, and, and then everything's going to be okay. Or... Are we motivated to do what is necessary to ca carry out the mission of Jesus Christ, as we read about in Matthew 28, to go into our world and make disciples by being disciples? You see, we cannot allow our personal preferences to trump the call to make disciples. I, I just don't think we can do that. 
In fact, when we look through Scripture, we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus' uh, command to his disciples, you're going to be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, and all Samaria, and then to the other ends of the world, right? We know that verse in Acts chapter 1. But what's interesting, as we walk through the book of Acts, they're all staying right there in Jerusalem. Have you noticed that? They're not really going out beyond their own walls. And so what happens is God says, all right, let's throw a little persecution their way. And as they're persecuted, they go do what God originally wanted them to do in the first place. I don't want that. Let's just go do what God wants us to do. We don't have to have the persecution to go with it, right? But, but God sometimes will force us into these positions. And I want to say this. If someone needs to sacrifice, it cannot be those that don't know the Lord. Did you hear what I said to you? If, if sacrifices have to be made, it cannot be that don't, those that don't know the Lord that need to make the sacrifices. The ones that need to make the sacrifice have got to be those of us that do. I, I think that's so important to say. And this morning as I was trying to prepare for this lesson all week, I, I thought about dropping a whole bunch of statistics at you. You know, to, to logic you to death. Here's why. This is, the, the, you know, I, I thought about that. I'm not going to do that. I also thought about sharing with you horror stories of people trying to come in and finding somewhere to sit, but because you won't move to the middle even when we ask you, that doesn't happen. And so I, talked, and I thought about sharing stories, how people don't know where to go, and so they either just walk away. I thought about sharing stories with you like that, but I'm not going to do that either. I know, I know that many of you are not in favor of moving to two services. I know that. I know that many of you aren't uh, liking this at all. I know that many of you are going to miss uh, having this incredible worship service like we had this morning, a full building. Let me just say, by the way, there's no reason why both of these services can't be full very, very quickly and very, very soon. I'll just throw that out there. You might be thinking, well, man, there's just some people I'm not going to get to talk to anymore. This just seems so divisive. There's so many things that are probably running through your head as we consider something like this. I want to say just a few things. I want to say this. If it was just about us, if it's just about us, then we have no reason to do this. If it's just about us, we're okay. We can squeeze in. We can make do. But the question has to be, what about everybody else? What about others? What about that new family that just moved into town? What about that single mom who's looking for a church home? What about that friend, that co-worker that you've been praying for and desiring beyond desire that they would come to know the Lord and be saved? What about making room for them? If somebody has to sacrifice, it has to be us, not them. Romans 15 verse 1, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let us each, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. There's the call of scripture on our hearts. And so here's what I'm asking you to do over the course of the next months, weeks, years, whatever God gives us. I'm asking you to be a church planter and to plant a church on your pew. That's what I'm asking you to do. To plant a church right there on your row, whatever you call it these days. Take the call of Jesus Christ to be a disciple seriously and go out and be a blessing to someone else. And listen to what the Apostle Paul says about our call here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, we know verse 17. It's one of those coffee cup verses. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We love that. But let's look a little further. Verse 18. And this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, and God is making his appeal through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But we're not done yet. Look at verse chapter 6, verse 1. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now listen to verse 3. 
we put no obstacles in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. If church is just about us, if it's just about our comforts, our likes, our desires, then what I'm telling you this morning is you don't have a very good picture of what church is supposed to be and the church that Jesus died for. I'm going to just be honest with you. And I want to say this as well as we think about all of this today. You were not saved just so that you can go to heaven. You were not saved just so that you can go to heaven. Yes, your soul and mine matters, but there is a bigger purpose that you and I are a part of. We, what we learn from Scripture from beginning to end is that God wants His glory to be known by all nations, all people, everyone. Not just you and me, not just Americans, not just Republicans, not just Democrats, not just Christians. When Jesus died on the cross, He died for the sins of mankind. And as completely committed followers of Jesus, we cannot lose sight of that. God called Israel to be a blessing to all nations, and he's called his church to be exactly the same thing. That's why we're called a chosen people in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. Why? So that we can proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into this marvelous, marvelous light. God has called us to be disciples who make disciples. And I truly believe that if we live our lives as disciples of Jesus, it won't be long until we're talking about a third service, and by that time you're going to be so excited it's not going to matter. Remember that the rabbi thinks we can be like him. The rabbi believes that we can do what he does. He believes in us. And so now we need to believe in ourselves and we need to go out and do what the rabbi did. I want to say this. Uh, I know a lot of you are saying, well, there's going to be certain people that I'm not going to get to see anymore. There is this thing we do on Sunday nights where, as far as I understand, uh, there's only one service on Sunday night. And if you really, really want to see that person, I think, man, Sunday night's a great time to come back together, to be together, to worship together, if you happen to miss them in the first service. Either way, there's opportunities for fellowship everywhere. But here's really the point I want to make as we close today. Our vision for what Jesus can do here at Beltline should never, ever, ever be limited to who we are or what we think we can do. Did you hear me? Our vision here at Beltline should never be limited to who we are or what we think we can do. In fact, if you really start thinking about it, the size of our vision isn't even determined by who God is. Because if it were determined by who God is, we'd be curing AIDS, eliminating global poverty, and everybody on the planet would have heard the gospel preached 50 times already if it was about who God is. So... The scope and impact of our vision is going to be determined by who you and I believe God really is. You following me? The scope and impact of our vision will be determined by who we believe God is. And whether or not we have the courage to respond accordingly to him. So here's what that means. Our view of God, Tozer said this in one of his incredible books, uh, our view of God is the most important thing about us. Our view of God is the most important thing about us. True faith is founded on what you believe about God and what he is capable of. And so we need to start believing that God is actually who he says he is. And that God can actually do what he says he can do. We need to continually remind ourselves that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And that nothing is impossible with him. And we can look through scriptures, places like Hebrews chapter 11, where we see that amazing hall of fame of faith, and we can be inspired by that. But until we personally have the right biblical picture of God, that's just a history lesson. It's just a history lesson. You see, people who walk by faith don't have some spiritual DNA that, that God has, has injected into them. They, they don't. They don't have that. What makes people who walk by faith unique, in fact, has very little to do with them. What makes faith walkers unique isn't their perfection. It is instead they understand God's perfect nature. And more than that, they understand God's purposes in this world. 
They understand that this is a God worth taking risk for. They understand that this is a God worth praying incredibly big prayers to. And so this morning, I'm calling you, calling you to a deeper faith walk. I'm calling you to a higher view of God and what he can accomplish in and through us who are sitting here in this building today. So begin to believe in a God who can do so much more than you think he can at this very moment. But don't just believe it. Take some action steps with this new, bigger view of God in mind. And remember that if Beltline is going to be successful in the eyes of God, it doesn't really matter if we're successful in anybody else's eyes, but if we're going to be successful in the eyes of God, every single one of us sitting here today has a part to play. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're reminded that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Listen to this now. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. These are exciting times. I hope that you're not aggravated. I hope you're not disappointed. I hope that you are encouraged today. I want you to leave here on a spiritual charge. Man, it's going to be exciting. I I can't wait to start doing whatever it is that I need to do to do my part to make this happen. Let's strive together. Let's strive together for the upward call of God that's found in Jesus Christ. And then we'll leave the results to him. We don't even have to mess with that. Isn't that amazing? We don't have to worry about the results All we have to do is walk by faith and not by sight and watch God do what God always does. And that is bless his people again and again and again. If you're here today and not a Christian, I have no idea what you're waiting for. But I hope today is the day that you make that decision to be a person who walks by faith and not by sight and says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I want to have my sins removed in the waters of baptism. If that's you today, we stand ready to help you, pray for you, get you where you need to be, and that is in Christ Jesus. If you're here today and you're just uh, struggling, maybe there's a lot of things going on in your life. We want to pray for you. We want to help you in any possible way that we can. We can. So why don't you come while we stand and we sing this song for your.